<clears throat> so, I just wrote some words on the board to kind of recap. The word essing, it's a corruption of this Jewish word ossing, which means doers or doers of the law. And that was the name given to the Essenes by outsiders. The Essenes themselves called themselves Israel, or the sons of Israel, the repentant of Israel. So they saw themselves like the new Israel and were preparing for the coming of the Messiah. And they saw themselves, their own bodies, as being physical temples of God. And that crosses over into Christian theology. St. Paul reminds us that we're temples of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself says, is he quoting Essing? Destroy this temple in three days and I'll rebuild it. And he's already like using again sort of Essing language and is incorporating that into his teachings. Uh, the word Joseph means he will make growth, he will multiply. And so here's someone named Joseph who decides he's taking a vow of virginity and nothing's sort of going to grow out of it, but yet he becomes the father of the Messiah and the savior of the world. And as was pointed out, that Joseph uh, is given authority by God, he's given this gift of being the father of the Son of God. And relationally, every child that we have is really God's gift to us. They're really sons and daughters of God, that we're stewards of his gifts. And by saying, the angel telling Joseph, you will name him Jesus, means you will have authority over him. You will be the legal father. You will have that, that authority. Mary doesn't name Jesus. Jesus, Joseph does. So, and he's, then Jesus then is incorporated into the house of David. And that other word, Cataluna, <clears throat> uh, is translated in, in the nativity scenes, and upper room in the passion narratives, but it really means guest house, no guest room. And the Cataluna was, where's the guest room? And that's the guest room of the Essenes again. It's sort of like, group that kind of like is hovering around uh, between the Old and the New Testaments. And <clears throat> I wanted to point out that um, the Essenes had a high regard for marriage. So if I quote again or take out of context one more time John Berg's book, um, what was neat with, this, with the Dead Sea Scrolls is that they had five copies of the Book of Tobit, which is a beautiful book on married life and family life. Uh, and it's interesting, it's one of those books that are sort of dropped by our Protestant brothers and sisters, and they don't have it yet. I mean, to have five copies of something, that's just like incredible. They, have, they love the prophet Isaiah, they have six copies of the Scroll of Isaiah. And uh, it, it's not exact proof that whatever the Essenes had were like actual books of scripture like that, this other thing called the Book of Jubilees and things like that, and we don't recognize that as canonical, <clears throat> so you can't say, oh look, that's a canonical book and that is or something. But what I do find interesting is, we'll talk about this in a second, in the flight into Egypt, um, how long was Jesus in Egypt, and where did Joseph and Mary go anyway? Uh, some traditional sources with a small t, like Prime Revelation says they went to a city called Heliopolis, which is the city of the sun, and kind of stayed there. Um, they went there because there was a, like a temple that was built by the Jewish settlers. Uh, I think they could have also gone to Alexandria, and Alexandria also had um, um, a, a high uh, percentage of Jews that were there in front of the diaspora. And there were different Jewish settlements throughout all the Mediterranean. St. Paul was going to preach the gospel. He, he first goes to the Jewish synagogue in the town and things like that. So you can find Jews all over the Mediterranean. And so even though the journey would have been difficult, Joseph and Mary probably would have found some Jewish settlements to go in to get some type of support. Uh, what's interesting with going to Egypt, whether they settled in Alexandria or Heliopolis, is there were two canons of scripture that kind of existed. We say the Palestinian canon around the time of the area of Palestine, or the Israel, and also the Alexandrian canon in Egypt. The Alexandrian canon is where we get from the Old Testament what's called the Septuagint. 
that is, um, by tradition, 70 scholars write in the 70 books and translated them from uh, the Hebrew into Greek. And so the Septuagint is like the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And in the Septuagint, we have what's called the Deuterocanonical books, those seven books of the Old Testament that Catholics recognize as scripture and that our Protestant brothers and sisters don't. And so again, just kind of thinking about all this, like why did Jesus, see what's neat is that whenever Jesus quotes the Old Testament or St. Paul or the Apostles, they, the Gospel writers quote the Old Testament, like 95% of the time they're quoted from the Septuagint, from the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And it's like, why does Jesus quote from the Septuagint if he's like from Palestine? Because when he first learned the scriptures, he grew up in Egypt. And he took on the regular customs of the practicing Jews who would have followed the Alexandrian Septuagint head. And so he simply, that's just because part of his understanding of the scriptures, when he moves back to Israel and Palestine, when he He's trying to find a quote from his memory. He just quotes from what he learned as a kid that St. Joseph taught him. It all makes sense in my mind, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, from the book of Tobit, and yes, questions? Yes. Um, does he ever quote from the uh, non non Septuagint? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does he ever quote from the, the seven Bibles? Right, yeah. Um, he, he, right, he quotes from, uh, most of the time when he quotes, he's quoting from the Septuagint, and the Septuagint includes the, uh, the Deuterocanonical books, it's sort of the second paper that Catholics recognize. But at other times, he does quote, we can find quotes from, uh, like the Hebrew, what we call the Hebrew Bible, and things like that. Um, and so, I mean, it's obvious that there was no official canon that existed in first century Palestine. And we have we have different synagogues having different copies of texts and things like that. But what we find interesting is that Jesus does quote most of the time St. Paul too and the uh, and like Matthew and Luke, they're quoting from the Septuagint. And so like for instance, I was just coming from Tobit. <clears throat> in the book of Tobit we have a scenario where there's a young woman who's been married seven times, and each of her husbands die on uh, their wedding night <coughs> because the demon Asmodeus comes by and kills them. Uh, and then she marries finally Tobias, uh, and he's saved. And he's, he's, and like, that's like the eighth, this, this is the symbol of the eighth, that's like the eighth husband, the eighth day, the day of eternity. And, and they get married. And then, and then uh, through the intersection of St. Raphael, the archangel, the, the, the demon flees. But um, what's interesting is that, again, it seems like even the Pharisees are influenced by the Deuterocanonical books because the, the line that they pitch to Jesus, a hypothetical is, oh, what if there's a woman who marries seven husbands? And, and who is there, who will be the husband of the resurrection? I mean, sorry, it's the, it's the Sadducees. They're trying to disprove the resurrection and, and throw the whole thing and making fun of it. <clears throat> Well, the fact that they even have that sort of hypothetical uh, suggests that they're, they're drawing something from the Book of Tobit. Now, they couldn't make the whole thing up themselves, but it's just like, this is already existing. And so, if they're posing that as a question to Jesus, like, you know, what about Sarah over here? Whose husband is she anyway? Whose wife is she, excuse me? <clears throat> and then, um, and even when Tobit gives advice to his son Tobias, we find... Um, he says something like, do to no one what you yourself dislike. And right there is the golden rule that Jesus sort of takes and flips and says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But in the Old Testament, that's the only line we find it that has that sort of negative phrasing, do to no one what you, what you yourself dislike. And then Jesus flips it back and he says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So again, he's quoting from the book of Tobit. <clears throat> Which, again, why would he quote from that if he didn't recognize that as something scriptural or canonical? <clears throat> and
when Jesus is talking about, when, when the Sadducees ask Jesus about marriage and about divorce, and when he's being questioned by the scribes and the Pharisees in chapter 19 of Matthew about divorce, uh, he, he quotes something that we find is quoted by, um, sorry, in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls about marriage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here, in what's called the Damascus document from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it, we, we find this passage. The builders of the wall, for them the builders of the wall were the Pharisees, and that was a, that was a kind of derogatory name the Essenes were calling the Pharisees. The, the true Israel was calling the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees build a wall around the law, but they say that their wall is faulty. The builders of the wall are caught in fornication by taking two wives in their lifetime. Although the principle of creation is male and female, he created them. And those who went into the ark went into the ark two by two. <clears throat> Concerning the leader, it is written, he shall not multiply wives to himself. Now, what's, um, what's interesting here is that when Jesus answers the Pharisees in Matthew, um, in Mark chapter 10. He says, what did Moses command you? And they said that Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to put it away. away. And Jesus says, for the hardness of your hearts, Moses did that. But from the beginning it was not so. From the beginning, God made them male and female. And for that reason... A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. When Jesus quotes to defend marriage, going back to Genesis, is exactly what the Essenes quote to defend marriage. They go right back to the beginning and they say there is no that, that divorce is wrong. And that, so Jesus has the same, obviously, the Pharisees, the Essenes have the same high regard for marriage. And they use in the same quote, they go back to the beginning of Genesis, in the beginning God made them male and female. And they're quoting that, and that's exactly what Jesus is in his argument and debate, debating with the, the Jewish leaders. Now, when Joseph finds Our Lady pregnant, there's all different theories of what's going on in his mind. And the stronger traditional theory is, of course, that he's sort of awestruck that he's already made this vow of virginity, that he knows who Mary is, that she conce conceives this child by the Holy Spirit, and that he wants to put her away quietly because he doesn't consider himself worthy. That's the, the humility um, aspect of it. And that he's trying to distance himself, like St. Peter at the Kepler Fish. Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. What I just saw is completely miraculous, I'm not worthy of it, and I'm going to, I'm just going to get out of here. And that seems to be the same response of St. Joseph, saying, okay, this is more than I bargained for. And he's, he's willing to put her aside quietly, but not make her face uh, what could be the repercussions of the law and getting a divorce. But what also occurs to me is that in his mind, the same thing that before Jesus says it, because he's not born yet, Joseph is saying, no. Male and female, he created them. And that he recognized that, that the two should become one flesh, pure spiritually. And he, part of his discernment, it seems to me, and this never occurred to me before we come to him to think about it more, is that he's safeguarding, he just knows the divorce inherently is wrong. He's not going to do any of that. He doesn't want to incorporate, he's going to embrace this gift as his own. He's, he's being told by the angel to do so. Do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife. But he's also saying, I, I can't divorce her. Because that's not God's will. Even though I don't feel worthy of this. There's, there's not even a question of like, we're throwing pots and pans at each other and things like that. It's like, this is like, this is just too holy for me and I can't accept this. But it's just like, but I can't walk away from this either. And so it's kind of interesting uh, to, to think that. <clears throat> And so I just wanted to kind of uh, bring that up as kind of a last reflection and just kind of point out some other things, how Joseph would have influenced Jesus. 
this talk is supposed to be about Joseph the hero, and we'll get to that hopefully very shortly. Because one talk kind of blends into the other, as all my talks do. <coughs> like, um, when we read the Gospels, fundamentally, who is Jesus? We would say he's a carpenter, but, but fundamentally, who is he? He's a great storyteller. He tells stories all the time to teach things. Why does he do that? Because his dad was a great storyteller. And it's just like they would work together in the carpentry shop and, and he'd just be saying like words of wisdom all the time and stories to his kid. And, and that's again what we should do. We should always be telling stories to our children, sharing on and passing on the tradition of one generation to the, uh, to the next, particularly again if they're small, or if, you know, if we skip a generation, just go to your grandkids, read stories to them. Any type of stories. Spending that time with our children, whether they're stories we make up or whether they're stories you simply read to them. And that is so beautiful. Again, something very small and very important. It's obvious that Jesus did that on a daily basis. That's the way that Jesus teaches. He doesn't teach in lectures like Father Andrew that drone on and on and go nowhere. He, he tells concrete stories that stick with us, and they're always there, like 2,000 years later. And he has these great little sayings, like, here's, and now, Potter again, as theologians, we get to say, where is Joseph in these lines? Now you're going to read the Bible in a new way, the way that I've been kind of reading it, the past whatever. <laughs> About judging others, the ways, you know, carpenter shop, saw, playing, Hey, you know what? Jesus, don't judge other people. <clears throat> you know, you know, a little sliver comes out. Ooh. And he goes, hey, you know what? A lot of people, they get a big log in their eye, and they go after the sliver in someone else's. That's going to be a Joseph quote. <laughs> Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice that log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye first, and you see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Think about that. That's something that you would just say to your son. Like, you know, this guy is going after him, and him is just like, he's got the problem. It's like, take care of himself first. And he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And process that, and then this... Ooh, gives us back these great quotes. But well, this other one, you know, it could be like in line one day and stuff like that. And, and you know, we see the poor and those people are struggling, those are marginalized. And Jesus looks at Jesus one day and he just says, You see those people? They're the last. One day they're going to be first. And those who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And Joseph already, again, Am I making this up? Maybe. Am I wrong? Well, you know, and I can burn the hell for it if I'm wrong. But anyway, it's just like, but I'm going to say, where is Joseph? And I bet, I barred him dollar, those are Joseph quotes that he's simply saying to Jesus. And we begin to read the scriptures in a way, how Joseph begins to influence the Messiah. And we recognize how we do that with our own children. I mean, uh, the great gift of sort of like being a priest and knowing many of you as I do and kind of going to your home sometimes and having dinner or something or, you know, driving your car or something. And, and there are things you don't notice about yourselves. Maybe you do. But, like, I see Dad doing this and I see your son doing the same thing. It's really amazing. And I'm going to call on anyone. There's just, like, how people say in a talk, okay, someone who's not here, okay, so there's a dad who drives, and whenever a woman cuts him off, <laughs> He calls her sunshine, so it makes weird and stuff like that. He goes, beep, it's like, oh, nice job, sunshine, and stuff like that. <laughs> I was in the car with his son, he's in his 20s now, okay, driving. A lady cuts him off, and you know what he says? Nice job, sunshine. It's the same thing. I couldn't believe it. Now I'm wearing a coat, my daughter's just saying, And we do that all the time without even realizing it, how our children pick up 
all sorts of habits that we say, things that we do, mannerisms. Those things happen with Jesus and Joseph all the time. Or, <clears throat> when you pray, do not keep up empty words like the Gentiles do, but they think that they will be heard for their many words. And he goes on and he says, um, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When Jesus is saying that, he's thinking of St. Joseph. He has an image of his mind of his father in his room, kneeling down and praying to God the Father. And I wonder about something else. What did Jesus, what did Joseph call Yahweh? If maybe as a son of David, as a Davidic king, because the kings, when you see the scriptures, would refer to God as Father. Did Joseph refer to God as Father? And he taught his son that. What degree? Does that happen? To what degree does Jesus appropriate that totally, recognizing himself as the second person of the Trinity, that God truly is my, my Father, by the same essential nature? And I bet Joseph saw God as like a type of Father. And he simply communicated that to his son. So, Lord, teach us how to pray. Well, when you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would we pray? And the Greek is really neat because it's like, Father in heaven, make it holy. It's like the imperative. Make it holy, the name of you. Make it come, the kingdom of you. Make it be done, the will of you. As in heaven, so on earth. That's the literal translation of the Our Father. That's part of it. And this is what Jesus taught to his disciples. And again, how he can take things that were probably given to him as a method of prayer that his own father Joseph taught him. <clears throat> and when you fast, do not fast like the hypocrites, standing on the street corners. Go in your room and shut the door, and, oh, I'm sorry, that's the other one. Do not look dismal. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by men, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So again, in Joseph fast, he sees that, and he sees that as this is what a man of God does. He sees St. Joseph as a man of God, as a man of prayer, as one who is completely attuned to the Father's will, and he takes all those ways of appropriation onto himself. <clears throat> when Joseph is called a just man, it's like, what does that mean? It, in the Old Testament, a just man is the same word that we would use in the New Testament as a holy one, as a saint. So the scriptures are already calling Joseph the same. And it's like um, <clears throat> the first psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is the law of the Lord, and his law, not his law, he meditates day and night. And again, with the psalms, these are prayers that any Jew would have prayed, and Joseph again teaches his son Jesus to pray the Psalms. And he begins to teach Jesus how to act as a just man in his life. And so, as our own prayer and reflection today and throughout our lives, whenever we read the scriptures, we're looking at the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, ask yourself a question Where's Joseph here? Where's Joseph's lives? Where is he? What, how did he communicate these things to Jesus? And there are some things that, you know, obviously Jesus comes from himself. And he says, like, I and the Father are one. That's a, a divine recognition. He's not, Joseph doesn't teach him that. He's like, you know, or at the age of 12, did he not know that I'd be my Father's house? Uh, and we see this, um, this divine understanding of Jesus uh, throughout the Gospels. But there's something else that Joseph impacts in the life of Jesus. And that is the passion of Christ. To recognize how did Joseph, what role did he have in the passion, in the suffering, and death of Jesus? And they say, well, none. He died before then. But the reality is, is that Joseph, as any father would, can still impact his son's actions, even though he's gone and has passed on. 
in the same way that any of us who have lost our own father, if you think, what would my dad do in this instance? Or, I wish my dad would do. What does Joseph teach Jesus every day of his life? I get up, I pray, I work, I provide, I help out the poor, make sure there's food on the table. All these simple things, little things, done with great acts of heroism. Ordinary things, done extraordinarily well. And everything that St. Joseph is a type of kenosis, a type of being poured out, a type of self-emptying. If we look at sort of a reflection of St. Joseph, then we can say the theology of the body, that St. John Paul II reminds us that we have to be a self-gift to others, that we have to give ourselves to another, to find ourselves. St. Joseph would have made a perfect self-gift to Our Lady. He would have made it himself a perfect self-gift to Jesus and to anyone who would have come into his orbit, whether in the carpentry shop or the poor that we met on the road. And again, Jesus' love of the poor had to be influenced by St. Joseph. Like, for instance, if it, whenever you saw a poor man on the streets, just kind of accuse yourself of this later in confession or something. And you see, like, there's someone over here, and he has, he puts it out his hand, like, you know, do you have something for me? And you and your, your five-year-old kid are over here, and it's going to get, oh, no, over here, Sonny, this way. Ignore this person, because you want to protect your kid and stuff like that. We don't hang out with those people. What are we teaching them? Get away from the people who smell. Get away from the people who are poor. Don't talk with them. Don't associate with them. Don't bother with them. Now think about this. What if every single time you saw someone who was poor, if your dad went right up to them and shook their hands and said, How are you doing, Bob? Good to see you today. And it's like, and you're like looking at him, like pretend you're a kid, and you're like, Oh, this is dad's old friend or something. Hey, want to. When you get a cup of coffee, I can get a subway for you and stuff like that. And what do you teach your kid? That every time you see someone who's poor, who's smelly, who's disheveled or whatever, or maybe needs a ride to try to Francis, then I teach them that these are people who are my friends. And would it actually teach our children that I seek out people, that I help them, that I want them that I provide for them. And if we all did that, like <clears throat> this whole generation, we would simply eliminate poverty in the next. Because, and this is marvelous, like St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, her, her family actually welcomed in the poor when she was like a girl. That they came, I mean, it's like, well, we never do that today, Father. Yeah, but when Jesus says, like, I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was naked and you clothed me, I was homeless and you welcomed me, he's actually not talking about the government to do that for us. He's actually saying, here's someone who's homeless, and welcome them into your home. And if we teach our children that, and, you know, we figure out how you want to do that, Let's say to impart this in you. <laughs> then, if I take in a homeless person, and you take in a homeless person, and they take in a homeless person, then they're not on the streets anymore. Then there's no particular shelter. It's like they're part of our family. Now, of course, like that's absolutely crazy. And I would say, yes, I agree with you, but that's what the gospel tells us to do. This is radical. This is what changes the world. This is what we're supposed to be doing every day. You have to pray to the Holy Spirit how you incorporate those things in your life. If you simply taught our children to love the poor the way that Joseph taught Jesus that, you have to learn that again as a man. And that's what he passes on to all of us. Who do we make poverty and hunger within a generation? <clears throat> and it only occurs to the extent that we take the gospel sincerely and literally. <clears throat> um, 
when we look to also find Joseph in the scriptures besides saying, where is Joseph in this Jesus quote? Or how has Joseph impacted Jesus in this instance? And what type of man must he have been already prior to even meeting Our Lady? We also find him in a special way in the book of Genesis. That is, chapters like 37 to the end, 50, in the Joseph cycle, the readings of Joseph, the coat of many colors, and his brothers. <clears throat> and we know that Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt. And Joseph had dreams. And so we see the Joseph in the New Testament having dreams. And it's not because the New Testament writers are trying to call attention to this Joseph, and I'm just kind of like taking these parts of the story and rewriting them. It's because these things actually happen. Joseph, in his dreams, was already attuned to the Holy Spirit. And Joseph of the Old Testament, this happens to him when he goes up in line from initially Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard, into Pharaoh's house. <clears throat> and we know that in these dreams, famine comes. There's seven years of plenty, and then there's seven years of famine. He interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh puts him in charge. And it says this in chapter 41, verse 53 of Genesis. The seven years of plenty that prevailed in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. And When we look at that and think of our of our own days, that this could be a scriptural verse applied to Saint Joseph. Here in the Old Testament, the Old Testament Joseph stores up grain. He's providing bread for those who are coming because there's a famine in the land. But isn't it true that today there's a famine in the land? A spiritual famine. That's over the entire earth. What family, Father? The family of truth. The family of family life. The family of divorce and remarriage. The family of, of birth. When we kill our children in the wounds of our mothers. And then we ask people to pay for it. There's a famine in the land, and it's over the whole earth. <coughs> and going back to Sober Amari's letter to his son Maximilian, he's saying, What's happening now over all the earth because of this thing that we call COVID? It's going to hyperdrive and it's accelerating. <clears throat> what do we do with this famine in the land? What does the scriptures tell us to do in this family the land? We must go to Joseph. He will give us bread. He will give us the bread of life. He will give us not just this bread, that grain, that can provide for daily needs like the Joseph of the Old Testament, the Joseph of the New Testament being the greater Joseph, who's in charge of all the possessions of the master of the house. The greatest possessions that he has. Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. These are the treasures that Joseph has. These are the treasures that he shares with us. These are the treasures that we need to grow in and to receive when there's famine in the land. 
And Joseph teaches us what to do with this man. And he opens up all the schoolhouses that we can receive. We need to go to Joseph in every need and in every necessity. Because different saints have different gifts, you see. Um, St. Anthony, when he's, we lose something, we just pray to St. Anthony, boom, we get something. Um, one time I was there, a couple lost their wedding ring in the, the church parking lot, and um, <coughs> they're like, you know, they're all frantic, and I'm like, you know, did you pray to St. Anthony? And before they slap me, I say, well, wait a minute, I mean, did you really pray to St. Anthony? So it's like, let's just pray. So he said, pray to St. Anthony, and I'll call him Hail Mary, and when we're done, this really happened. I simply looked down, and there was the wedding ring right there. <laughs> and I didn't see beforehand. I'm just like, you know, I'm just trying to listen to what you're saying. And I'm just like, okay, let's pray and let's stop looking. So, oh, well. And so, uh, and we find this, I mean, it, it must be true. Because, I mean, obviously, I mean, St. Saint, Saint Anthony died 700 years ago, right? I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to pass on some custom or tradition that doesn't work. It, 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 it exists and endures in church because it works. So saying, you know, this guy finds lost items, this person cures pants over here, this person has, you know, marital situations and stuff like that. And all different saints have different things that happen to them. That sort of, a sort of um, aspect of the faith that you kind of govern or have a sort of access to. But what does Joseph have? Does he have a special gift that he can kind of share with us? We'll see in our next talk that Joseph has everything that we need. Not only does that Jesus and Mary, but he's given a special grace to give us everything that we need in prayer, in this family that we encounter. And the reality that Joseph is our father, who gives us everything we need. And we'll see, we'll kind of conclude how Joseph is a hero, because he goes exactly to do the opposite of what anyone would think as being obedient. He goes right into Egypt and follows the Father's will, even though it's completely against what we can say common sense. But by doing so, uh, he gives us many beautiful things we see in tradition. Like again, my connection to the Septuagint that Jesus is quoting and showing us the canon of Scripture. Uh, connections we see by his obedience with perhaps the essence, by giving everything up. It's for the Messiah, being at a complete service, and a servant of him, as our lady was. And next we'll see how Joseph, being the one we go to in famine, is the hope of our times, the one who can help us in our world, and that one who can give us hope for the future. I'm going to end well, slightly early, only because Midday prayer is not on the schedule, but I have to pray it myself, so I want to give myself more time. And I will begin the next section by asking questions. I, I want to make sure that questions are answered, or things we can share upon our reflections. <laughs> so, let's see. We'll do the Angelus right now, and uh, I'll say a blessing for the meal. <clears throat> And then the next talk will be at one o'clock. Joseph. <clears throat>